we really want to collect. And all of these are important to understand the state of your applications. So have you heard of the term of observability before? Or, so this is becoming the new, the new term that, when we first started using it, I was like, hmm, never really heard of it. But now, more and more, instead of talking about logging, talk about observability, which is the, in addition to logging, looking at ingesting metrics and tracing information. So the whole idea behind observability, depending if you studied engineering and control systems, is to try to, by looking at the outputs of a system, to, to have visibility of the internal state of it. So in this case, we're talking about applications that run on containers, and you have the, the underlying infrastructure that are supporting those applications, and you want to understand, make sure that they're working as they should. If there isn't uh, some sort of performance issue, try to, to narrow down what the issue is. And uh, there is some overlap between the metrics tracing and logging. And uh, when, you when you're looking to, to try to troubleshoot an issue, typically you need to look at all three of those. And with Elastic, we'll see it later throughout the presentation, you can, you can do all of that with a single tool. So that's one of the, the values of Elastic. So before we, we dive into observability for Kubernetes, I'm going to give a short overview about Elastic and the stack, just to, to level set what we do, so you have a better understanding of what Elastic is and what we do. We went public as a company last October, and that forced us to, to come up with a definition of what we are as a company. And the, common, the commonality of all we do is search. So we're a search company. The, the, and when we talk about search, it's not only searching for, uh, you know, for, for text in an application, like when you go on Wikipedia, it's powered by Elasticsearch. But it's also when you zoom in a map, or when you try to, to narrow into a, a graph, or like trying to search for anomalies in your data. All of these are search use cases. And how is Elastic different from other technologies? There are many technologies that allow you to just a lot, large amount of data and to some extent, search that data. Uh, Elastic was designed from the ground up to be scalable horizontally. So there is no limit to the size of the cluster. We have some clients, many of those in the intelligence community that like to run clusters with hundreds of nodes, if not thousands, petabyte scale. Not necessarily the best practice. Best practice would be to have many small clusters and use cross-cluster search to search your data across different clusters. It's very fast. Uh, find matches in milliseconds, so whenever you do a query, you're never talking about a lunchtime query or a coffee break query or a nighttime query. For those of you that are using some products, are probably familiar with that. And uh, the reason for that is that it's a uh, it's search engine at core. Every time you store a document, we're going to go into more detail later about you know, what the format of a document and how it works. All the fields of the document are analyzed. And we store together with the document some metadata, such as inverted indices for full text search, that will make the search go fast. And that's done automatically. And you have the capability to, to customize the templates and the, the models that you use if you know that certain fields, you know, you're never gonna search as a full text. So you can save a little bit of space that way. But that said, by default, everything is analyzed. So you don't have to define manually an index like you will do in an RDMS type of system for the type of queries that you want to go fast because that's done automatically for everything. So there is no manual index creation. And also relevance comes into play being a search engine. You want to, whenever you search data, you want to get the relevant data based on what you're searching. And so that comes out of the box. Uh, if you look at other technologies that are available, uh, like Hadoop, for example, Hadoop is great at scale. Can store a massive amount of data. Relevance, yes, but it suffers when it comes to speed. And it's also quite complex to get information out of the data when you use it. Other technologies like MongoDB, uh, they give the scale, uh, speed to some extent, not necessarily relevance because they're not designed to be searching. So Elasticsearch started, Elasticsearch is the main product. The first product was released in 2010 as an open source project. And uh, most of what I'm discussing today is open source or free. So there is a, it's free to use. 
And we have some commercial features. We have a set, we're going to touch on that, but I'm not going to spend too much time on the, on the commercial side. So just want you to know, as you, as you see what, what's possible, that all of that can be done using the open source and the three features. Uh, Elasticsearch started as a Shrey Bannon, our CEO and founder of Elastic, was the one that actually wrote Elasticsearch and released Elasticsearch as an open source project. And uh, when he did that, the only use case that he had in mind was application search. And uh, when we talk about application search, we talk about Uber, for example. In this case, there is geolocation that, that comes into play, trying to find a driver or a car in a specific radius from you. And uh, Yelp uses Elasticsearch, eBay uses Elasticsearch, GitHub uses Elasticsearch, pretty much the de facto standard for application search today. So any application that does some search functionality, more likely than not, is based on Elastic, uh, is using Elasticsearch in the back end. When Elasticsearch was released to the community, the community started using Elasticsearch to store different type of data that Shai never really envisioned, starting with logging. So you have this like, scalable search entry, why not store logs in it? And uh, the challenge was at the time that Elasticsearch is, was designed for application search, REST API. IT professionals typically don't like to write scripts just to, to index a log into a system. That's how Bits and Logstash and Kibana were born as open source projects to make it easier to ingest logs and metrics into Elasticsearch and to make it easier to visualize and search data stored in Elasticsearch. So the heart of the Elastic is Elasticsearch. So all our products and solutions are based on Elasticsearch. When you talk about Elasticsearch, you will talk about a cluster of nodes, again, the skills horizontally. Multiple nodes, you may have dedicated node types for certain uh, features like machine learning. We use the term index to describe the loosely the equivalent of a database in our DBMS. It's not, this is NoSQL, so the document format is JSON. So the, you're not talking about relations. If you don't do joins, typically you denormalize the data when you store it in Elasticsearch. And we also use the term index to describe the action of storing a document in Elasticsearch because everything is indexed by default. You don't have to create index indices separately to spin up certain queries. The document format is JSON. So that's how, that's how data is stored in Elasticsearch. And, uh, and whenever you create an index, you specify how many shards you want the index to have and how many replicas. The, the default is one and one. So you have a one primary shard and one replica. The idea is that the replica will rest, well, uh, Elasticsearch force enforces that, resides in a different node. So you have high availability out of the box. And if a node goes down, there is another node that is holding that data. So everything will still keep functioning. Another benefit of replicas is the, the search throughput. Replicas are used for search as well. So there are use cases that, for example, Wikipedia, and those use cases in which the amount of data is not huge for us. We're talking about a few terabytes. You may want to have more replicas to speed up the search. And number of primary shards, you know, that's the, it depends on how much data you're looking to ingest. You don't want those shards to be too big. You don't want them to be too small. 30 to 50 gigabytes is typically what we target. Yes? Is there like some specific core algorithms or algorithms you guys are based on? For example, like with DCOS and Rezos and everything based on like burpees, like DRF, dominance, or something like Elastic. So Elastic is based on an open source library called Apache Lucy. So every shard, it's an instance of Lucy. So what, what Shai did is basically make a product based on a library. So each shard by itself, it's a main search engine. And whenever you search data, you have multiple parallel queries that return a subset of the results, the node that receives the request, that aggregate all the results and send them to the client. So part of the, you know, Going back to the community using Elasticsearch for different use cases, again, it started with applicational search and then moves to logging. In the last few years, many started using Elasticsearch to, for, to store metrics. And uh, so we have made several changes 
done with the Lucene level. We control the roadmap of Lucene. We are the main contributors of Lucene as well. To optimize the storage and the handling of additional data types in addition to text, such as corner stores, perspective data, BKD trees for numbers, and uh, adding additional features like rollups. This is very useful when you're storing metrics that you're looking to, to minimize the space requirement as the data ages. So you can do some aggregations of your data as it ages. Uh, this is a uh, this is Kibana, and Kibana started as a way to to visualize and search the data stored in Elasticsearch. This is an example of a dashboard. In the last few years, it has also evolved to become a management interface. Now it can create users, it can create machine learning jobs, it can monitor the health of the stack. All of that is part of Kibana, and uh, we have been adding additional addition to dashboards like this one. We have been adding applications inside Kibana such as Canvas, that allows us to create infographics. Think of these as uh, live PowerPoints that are powered by live data. This is machine learning screen. This is the Kubernetes uh, infra monitoring UI. This is designed specifically for, for metrics, for the metrics use case, monitoring the data. And uh, we added, recently we added support for maps. You can have multiple layers. And this is all part of the, the free. Okay, so Logstash is the, it's an ETL tool. So you wouldn't probably use it much with Kubernetes, but you may have other use cases which may require using Logstash. It supports multiple different input interfaces, many different modules that you can use to enrich and normalize the data, and support for multiple outputs. Of course, the most common output is Elasticsearch. But then you may have use cases in which you may want to store a copy of the data that you are ingesting using Logstash somewhere else, like in an S3 bucket somewhere. For example, you can do that with, uh, with Logstash. Logstash is really powerful and uh, Java based, so it requires some resources. So you don't want to deploy Logstash from an endpoint just to collect the local flat files in the system. For that, you want to use Beats. So bits are lightweight data shippers. They're written in Golang. They're designed to have the, the, minim, the minimal amount of footprint when it comes to the amount of resources they need to run. Currently, they're single purpose, meaning that you may have to install more than one on a host. Uh, most common ones are file bit, metric bit. We're going to talk more about those. If you're looking to sniff network data, this packet bit. Wing log bit is to, to ingest uh, Windows event logs. Heartbeat is to monitor infrastructure uh, remotely. Like if you think of products like Nagios, where you, you monitor the uptime or the latency of systems, you can use Heartbeat for that. I'm going to talk more about that later, but this is basically, I'm going to talk about the observability trifecta. This is another part of that that you can think of adding when it comes to observability. Audit bit, that's mostly used for security use cases. To collect information about you know, file integrity monitoring, processes running, commands executed on the system. Function bit is a serverless shipper currently exported by AWS Lambda. So it uh, comes in very useful if you use uh, AWS to ingest logs uh, that are generated by AWS services. Uh, bits come with modules. We're going to talk today about the modules for Kubernetes and for Prometheus. And when you think of a module, is, uh, it includes parsing rules, that do some level of enrichment as well, out of the box content like uh, dashboards, machine learning jobs, all of that come with uh, modules. We have a, a public facing demo site if you want to play with Kibana without installing it, demo.elastic.co. You can have a can look at all the dashboards that come with different bits and obsession modules, for example. And it's uh, and this is how uh, all the components work together. So you have a cluster of elastic sort of nodes, you have a Kibana that is that is linked to a cluster. Uh, cluster is designed to run within the same data center or the same re cloud region. So you may have nodes in different availability zones, but it's not designed to run across you know, 
geographies. So if you want to do that, you should use post laser search and other post lasers for that. And a feature that we released when we added when we released Beats is is uh, ingest nodes or ingest pipelines inside Elasticsearch. Historically, Logstash was the only component that would allow you to do normalization and enrichment of data, such as doing a, a GeoIP lookup on an IP address before you store it into Elasticsearch. When we released Beats, we added functionality in Elasticsearch called ingest pipelines. And it's basically, your bits are just collecting, you know, think about file bit, taking a flat file, one row at a time, they're sending that to Elasticsearch directly, specifying the name of pipeline. That will do, that may do a dissect, structure the, going from one row to adjacent. We have the support for enrichment as well, some types of enrichment, not all the enrichment types that Logstash can do, but the most common ones like GOIP agents and so on. And we're working on to add more, more capability directly in Elasticsearch. The benefit of doing that is that you don't have to have this additional layer just to do data, data normalization and enrichment. You can do that in Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch scales horizontally, so the, the capability of processing data scales as the cluster grows. With Lobstash, you may have to have a load balancer or figure out how to make the Lobstash highly available or how to manage uh, scaling of it. Uh, use cases that will always require the Lobstash are cases in which you have to pull data from a system, like connect it to a database to read logs off a table or connect to a web API or a cloud API for that. Do you have any questions about for those of you that are new, that makes sense. I have a, <laughs> yeah, sure. a question. Uh, we, we use AWS, uh, the AWS Elasticsearch for the, for, uh, the is Beats and Logstash, you know, if they're available on the AWS clusters. So AWS is uh, the AWS Elasticsearch service. It's a fork of our open source. Okay. And there are many features. So we, like many other open source companies, we, we released uh, some features under a different license that is basically restrictive when it comes to, you know, if you are a public cloud provider, unless you have a partnership with us, you cannot offer those features. Okay. So you can certainly use Logstash, and like we have a public cloud, I'm attaching it in a minute to uh, Elastic Cloud. Logstash is not part of it. Uh, like with AWS CS, what you get as a service is Elasticsearch and Kibana. Okay. Lobstash and Beats, you will deploy those on an EC2 instance. Right? And it's the same today on our SaaS. What's different, you know, the Beats and Lobstash, you know, they're open source. In several modules for Beats are Elastic license. So you, you wouldn't be able to talk to the AWS ES service with those modules. So that's the way for us to differentiate what we do versus AWS just grabbing open source and uh, offering that as a service without contributing back to it. And uh, any other questions? Yeah. So we're most available as containers that you could run under Kubernetes or? Yeah, yeah, I will touch on that in a minute. Yeah. So deployment models. You can download, install, support Linux, Windows, Mac, all of them. We have our SaaS, call it Elastic Cloud. You can run Elastic Cloud on AWS. We have private SaaS as well, so you can run in a private inside your own VPC as well, with the private link. And, uh, and right in between, we have this uh, commercial product called Elastic Cloud Enterprise. This is for use cases where you can't use the public cloud or don't want to use the public cloud, but want to have the same user experience that you would have from SaaS. So this is a product that you can install anywhere, and it has a user interface that is pretty much identical to our Elastic Cloud, where you can just create uh, clusters with a click and uh, orchestrate them, you know, do upgrades and all of that. But Kubernetes, uh, last year we decided to 
to double down on the well native foundation Kubernetes. We have seen, as I mentioned earlier, specifically here in the Rockies and the West region of the US, everyone is moving to Kubernetes. And uh, all, the all the companies that use Kubernetes, they want to use Kubernetes for all their workloads. So they don't want to have a one-off you know, virtual machines or something else just for Elasticsearch. And uh, we have noticed that uh, community members started releasing help charts that uh, companies started using, and we couldn't really support that because of the, you know, we had no idea of you know, whether it were stable or not. Yes? So let's say I want to run Elastic in my Kubernetes cluster. Yeah. But how many containers do I need? Can I, can I just have, is it just, is it fit in one container, or do I have to run so, different kinds? Okay, it scales horizontally, right? So you will typically have, for any production cluster, you would have three or more containers. And ideally, those three containers for Elasticsearch will be residing on different physical hosts for availability, different nodes. Those are the three main services you have in that So, and uh, yeah, so, so you, would, you would have been. Or are they the same three containers, or are they three different containers? Are they different Docker images or the same image? Same image. Okay, so same image, image part with the same cluster name, Got it. but different, different instances, part of the same cluster. So what, what, what defines a cluster is the, the name that you give to the cluster. By default, that's Elasticsearch. And uh, so uh, talking about, you know, so the community started basically, you know, because there was a need for that, that we were not feeling, they started creating their own Helm charts. So what we decided to do is say, we need to take control of these and, and release our own. So last December at uh, KubeCon, Seattle, we announced our partnership with the Palmative Foundation. We released a Helm charts for Elasticsearch and Kibana. Uh, more recently, we released Helm charts for, for Beats. Uh, KubeCon Barcelona, a couple of months ago, we announced the last cloud of Kubernetes. So this is an operator for Kubernetes to run Elasticsearch workloads. So this is the beginning of it. Uh, there are gonna be different, uh, different levels of licensing. There is a free tier, and there is gonna be commercial tiers as well on top of that. And, uh, and our vision is that you know, with DCK, uh, with DCK there, you can uh, you know, manage multiple clusters, you know, upgrade the new stack version. So do what you can do with Elastic Cloud Enterprise, do what you can do with uh, with our SaaS if you want to run it on Kubernetes. So in addition of using Elastic to monitor Kubernetes and workloads on Kubernetes, you can, have, you can run Elastic on, on Kubernetes. Now we have an operator as well that we really support with that. <laughs> Any questions about deploying the search? A progression? Sure. As far as like take backups, um, if you're taking a backup, say so you can pull on a backup of that cluster, do you, do you just target one, one node? So yeah, when, when you take a backup, you use the term snapshot, you take a snapshot of one index. And that index, if you have multiple nodes, will more, if, you have, if it has one, more than one primary shard, it will have data spread across multiple nodes. Right? So when you, take, when you take a snapshot, you will basically create a backup copy of the index data and save it as a file. But that's how Elasticsearch scales, right? So you have, you basically spread data across multiple nodes. So you leverage parallelism. So whenever you search your data, you have multiple nodes that are doing the query and then returning the, the, the uh, subset of the results, the coordinating node. The coordinating node is the node that receives the request from the client. Any other questions? About the last thing, about the stack in general. All right, so logging for Kubernetes. So, probably all know that Kubernetes doesn't have. Uh, are you all using Kubernetes or uh, to use Kubernetes? Do you know what Kubernetes is? Yeah, we get the sanction <laughs> Many don't. Oh, wrong class. Many don't. I can't even learn about Kubernetes. So, <laughs> okay. I know a little bit. You know a little bit. So, 
Kubernetes is a, a product that allows you to orchestrate containers. So what we have seen in the past, we've seen the move from bare metal to virtual machines, and then the move from virtual machine to containers. And once you have a bunch of containers, you need to figure out a way to manage all of them. And that's, that's what Kubernetes provides. So the idea is that you know, it's, it's a way to orchestrate and manage multiple containers. So when you're talking about logs and Kubernetes, these are logs coming from the containers then? Uh, logs from the, the, the Kubernetes services themselves and logs from the, the containers, the applications running in the containers themselves. Okay. And the, the observability challenge with Kubernetes is that these pods and containers, they're, they're created and destroyed dynamically. So you're basically it's a moving target, and uh, the observability is, is more challenging because of that. <laughs> you're not dealing with uh, no, a single server that you know where it is. So, so did the logs keep track of one pod and container? The I think it's uh, if you have a one of the so that there is no uh, depending on how you configure by default, it's only logging to the local node. The node dies, you lose the logs, right? If right. You have so you have to figure out a way to aggregate those logs and store them somewhere so you can easily search them. So that's one of the challenges. We're just talking about log. Yes? So is your recommended solution paints to ship the logs? Because a lot of communities yeah. are just full of paints. Yeah, yeah, touch on that in that two slides. So, uh, Again, there is no native solution, right? You could run the kubectl logs uh, to get print out of the logs. The recommended approach is to do cluster level logging, where you have uh, you know, all the different containers that log into a, to a specific file. And that file is picked up by, by some logging agent that will store, ideally, you want to store those logs off the cluster. Because if, you know, off the Kubernetes cluster, you want to store them somewhere else. And uh, application level logging is not recommended as well. It's like basically you are configuring your applications running containers to send logs directly to, to an analysis search cluster. And uh, that, that requires to change all the applications to do that. And you probably, you're running many applications that you don't write yourself. Right? And uh, the Kubernetes logging solution, so there are two optional logging agents that come with uh, Kubernetes deployment. Deployments are a stack driver for GCP and uh, allows for the Elastic Search. And both of these are based on the tool FluentD. You can think of FluentD as loosely as a equivalent of a beat, even though it's, it's not affiliated with Elastic. It's a product that allows you to, to, to make it easier to ingest data, translate it into a JSON for Elastic Search or other outputs. And uh, so these are the idea is to deploy. Uh, these agents as a daemon sets, meaning that you always have one running on each node, right? It's like a, a demo in Linux. And uh, what we, uh, what you, so you, you, you can do this, and you can still leverage Elasticsearch, or you can use bits for that. So talking about logs, with FileBit, uh, we, uh, what you gain by using FileBit, is that FileBit, when you install the Kubernetes modules on FileBit, it will start querying the API server of Kubernetes and listening and caching all the activity that you see when a pod is created and destroyed and store that information internally. So whenever the FileBit is used to ingest logs from different Docker containers, those logs are enriched with that metadata. And when I talk about metadata, so you, you run it you know, like you would do with the logging solutions like with, that are fluently based, you run it as a dem demo set. And uh, this is some of the metadata that you, that FileBit is gathering from the Kubernetes API. And this information is then stored in the logs that are enriched with this information. So it becomes easier to make sense out of the log because they, this adds some context, context that is specific to, to Kubernetes. So you get you know, the container ID, the container name, and so on. This is an example of uh, 
enriched log, right? So you get all this information, all this meta information that come in addition of the log itself, right? So if this is specific. So this is the message itself. And if you use file bits, that log is enriched with all this contextual information that is collected from the API. So another great feature that FileBeat provides is auto discovery. And again, going back to the challenge of having dynamic workloads. Uh, with Kubernetes, you can, uh, with, with, with auto discovery and FileBeat, you can create a policy like this, where you can say any container that has Nginx as part of the name, instrument, you know, use the, the Nginx module and automatically start pulling logs from that container. So this is all done automatically. So whenever you have a new Nginx container coming up, you're automatically got grabbing the logs from it without having to, the only configuration you do is on the file bit running as a, as a demo set. And after that, you, you can have, of course, a few of these. The collection of logs is all automated. And uh, again, we touched on modules earlier, but the, you know, every module is basically a set of parsing rules to structure the, the, the log messages as a JSON, a set of key value pairs, ingest pipeline to do that, and maybe do some enrichment as well, and uh, dashboards, alerts, and machine learning jobs that you can use out of the box. These are some of the modules that we support, uh, many more of these that we have released in the, the last few months, and uh, the chance to update this. And, uh, and this is, you know, we keep investing in our support for Kubernetes, again, because we, we're seeing this as the future. Currently, we're seeing everyone using this. So these are some of the recent announcements that we, we have done in the latest release uh, to support additional uh, messaging frameworks. So, do you have uh, any questions about this? So this is for the logging part. Not just Docker. So the, the second part of uh, the observability trifecta is uh, metrics. And again, when you look at metrics, different tools that you can use to collect those metrics, and uh, you need to store those metrics somewhere. Uh, some organizations use InfluxDB, some use Elasticsearch, different ways of analyzing metrics as well. Then is one of those. And uh, similar to what you, you do with FileBeat to automatically ingest logs, you can do the same with metric beat. So you deploy that as a, as a demo set, and uh, you, you, in, in this will automatically monitor you know, all the pods and service codes come with them that, uh, that you have running. We have dashboards. This is an older version. We have a, a dedicated UI in Kibana designed specifically for monitoring. And this is most of these custom apps inside Kibana for specific use cases are a part of what we call the base license. So you're not going to find it on AWS. So if, you're, if you go in Kibana and AWS, you're not going to see. If you look at the web, I have some more recent screenshots later. We have many, many of these apps now. If you, if you go and if you just use the pure open source, it only has a few of those. And again, you can use auto discovery uh, for, uh, with, with metrics as well, similar to what you, you can do with, uh, with files. So, you, you skip a similar example, you're looking to collect metrics from Nginx. You can create a policy for Nginx to collect metrics from Nginx. Several different metric bit modules. And this list is ever growing that we are adding support for. And, uh, and this is uh, some of the, the recent uh, new features we added in Savage for uh, DNS module, simulations. So many use Prometheus. Is anything using Prometheus to collect metrics? Yeah. So you're familiar with, with Prometheus. And uh, so there are two key components of Prometheus. Prometheus exporters and the Prometheus server. So Prometheus exporters are components that you can embed as part of your application that you can query for metrics. 
So it's a, it's a pull model versus a push. So you, and, uh, and Prometheus server is a, a server that can start to store those metrics that you get using pulling Prometheus exporters. There are some limitations of Prometheus server. Uh, it does not support clustering, so scaling is a challenge there if you're looking to, to retain those metrics for an extended period of time or at large scale. That's a challenge. Uh, there is no, no fine grained security, there's no encryption of data, and uh, so it's, uh, it, it works for small deployments, but for, for the enterprise type of use cases, the, the, the limitations are quite important. So uh, we have modules uh, for file for metric B for uh, for Prometheus that allow you to to connect to the API exposed by Prometheus exporters to pull metrics from them directly without the need of using uh, a Prometheus server. So you can just use the Prometheus exporter instead of using Prometheus server. You can just use metric B and pull those metrics using metric bits into Elasticsearch. And, uh, and we, they support TLS, all our bits support TLS. And recently, uh, if you follow uh, recent releases, when we released 7.1, and that was primarily related to the release of Elastic Cloud for Kubernetes, the operator for Kubernetes. We made some of the security features that historically were commercial, that you have to get pay for a subscription to use part of the free tier. So now you have role because asset control is part of the basic license. So even if you use the free version that you download, you get access control. You can and you have TLS encryption inside the Elasticsearch cluster. Until before 7.1, we did that change for 7.1 and 6.8. So if you're using an older version, if you're just using the pure open source, there is no encryption of data in transit, there is no access control. So anyone with physical access, network access to, to a cluster can do anything. And uh, as we were looking at releasing the operator for Kubernetes for Elasticsearch, we didn't want to release something that wasn't secure. So our vision is to, to for any cluster to be secure out of the box. Right now, you still have to do some configuration to configure TLS. You have to create certificates, install certificates. We're working on, on making that an out-of-the-box experience, so any cluster will be secure when you install it. And this is with the free version. And uh, if you're seeing the news data breaches that involve Elasticsearch clusters, those are open source Elasticsearch clusters that were not secure. So we want to fix that. We want security to be full. And uh, you, in addition of collecting metrics from, from Meteos exporters, which is basically the equivalent of collecting metrics from your applications that are instrumented with Meteos exporters, you can retrieve metrics from the Prometheus server itself. So there is a way to do that, and this is based on the federal API. And there is also a, a Prometheus beat, that's a community beat, that can, uh, that, that can do that as well. And, uh, and finally, you may want to monitor the health of the Prometheus service itself. So we uh, use the stats uh, API for that, so that's possible as well. So if, you're, if you choose to use and keep using Prometheus server, you can use Elastic to monitor the health of the Prometheus server itself. Any questions about the monitoring part? So tracing, um, so going back to the kind of the history, how we got where we are with Elastic. Released Elasticsearch as open source. Other open source projects were born around it, such as Logstash Beats, our Elastic Cloud, so, sorry, not Elastic Cloud, um, Beats and uh, Logstash. And in addition to open source projects that ended up becoming part of Elastic, there, there were many companies, and there, there are many companies that created some uh, value added functionality based on Elasticsearch. And APM is one of those. So, this is the result of an acquisition we did. We acquired a company that built up APM functionality on the top of Elasticsearch, and we chose to release all of that 
combination of open source and free. So that this is, I, I think today, Elasticsearch is the only free open APM solution that you can use. And uh, for you already know, microservices can be complicated, right? If you have many, many microservices and, and tracing information allows you really to have visibility over what's going on within the application itself. So we have an open source APM built on the Elastic, the top of the Elastic stack, with support for uh, uh, open tracing, the uh, sort distributed tracing, and uh, real user monitoring. So this is the instrumentation at the browser level, so you can see how long it takes from a, from a request to go from the browser to the first application server. You can tag requests, so you can follow them as they go from microservice to microservice. Another acquisition we did uh, recently is a code search company, source code search company. And that's available now. They, they, we, did, we just finished the integration that is available now as beta in 7.2, the latest release. So you can, for example, connect to a GitHub repository, index all the source code. And the, the, the vision is that with APM, if you get a stack trace of an error, with the help of code search, you can follow the code from one microservice to the other. So it's, the idea is to have an equivalent of a distributed debugger for microservices. And uh, so this is the third leg of observability. So these are the, all the different languages that we've been supporting for a while. So all the major frameworks for, for Java. And we, the, the missing one was .NET. So we got lots of requests for .NET, and we just we released that as beta now and part of Signature. So we now have support for .NET as well. So if you're using .NET, uh, you can uh, you can instrument your .NET applications uh, to get all the tracing information. So this is the UI for um, for APM. So again, this is not specific per se to Kubernetes. It's just you know you're instrumenting applications that you run on the top of Kubernetes. And uh, how do you get those uh, those traces? Uh, you instrument your applications, and those those applications will start sending those traces to an additional component that you'll have to deploy. In Elastic Cloud, you, this is deployed by default, an APM server. You know you can get one for free, and you can of course pay to have more capacity. And the APM server will start, similar to Logstash, but this is specific to APM will produce a JSON for Elasticsearch. Yeah. Pre built APM agents for those applications that you can just plug in? Like so, depending on, the, depending on the application, uh, like with Java, we have it's just a jar. So, if, you, if, you, if you're running Java, you don't have to touch the, your application, your Java applications. You only have to change. The parameters that you pass to Java to say use this agent for APM, and you pass a few parameters specifying this is the IP or the URL of the APM server. With other languages, you may have to, you may have to change the code just to add a little. You know. Well, I was just wondering when you say you have to instrument it in your application. Yeah. How much work you have to do? It's it's, it's, it's like copy and paste like a, a little blower of code. It's okay, okay. And, and include a library. It's, it's very it's very straightforward. So it's uh, not too much. <laughs> now we saw that. Yeah, yeah. sure. I was curious about the APM server. Yeah. How that uh, Helm charts for that? We don't have Helm charts for that yet. So you would have to. Is that a reference license too? No. The APM server is open source. The APM. Uh, UI this this is basic license free. So this is free. But you wouldn't get it on AWS. You will, you will get it if you use Elastic Cloud or if you self manage. And uh, yeah, we saw that you know you can use Elastic to do all the all these three together. An additional part of observability that we it's not something new, but it's the, the UI that we released for it is new. So this is based on Heartbeat. It's one of the bits I mentioned earlier that you can configure to monitor your infrastructure 
possibly from multiple locations, right? You may monitor like, like from, from different geographical areas to, you can monitor latency up and down, or uh, you can check an HTTP response code. In many cases, it's used to do a health check of the application. Right, you have a page that does some checks on, you know, if the SQL server on the back end up and running, and so on. So with uh, uh, a few minor releases ago, we released this, uh, this UI, that is a UI that is basically designed to, to visualize the data that is collected using heart. So this is, I see this as, as part of observability. Another useful use case of um, Heartbeat is uh, monitoring cert certificates. And for a large enterprise, it's hard to keep track of certificates. When, when are they expiring? And then one day, the yes, certificate expires, and no one can access, and everyone is getting that warning message. So you, you have the support for that as well as part of Heartbeat. So that was my, my last slide. We have time for what are the three pillars? So the three pillars, metrics, logging, and tracing. This is in a way is a fourth pillar, maybe we should uh, write the blog post to say. Yeah. With the uptime, is it, does it require an agent or anything? It's a beat. Okay. So it's a beat.